You can't even define fascism. I challenge Kamala to tell us what it is because a majority of the country doesn't know the word. She needs non-college educated blacks, whites, and Hispanics to turn out for her. And she is smearing her rival as with a mid 20th century European political philosophy. Okay, Jessica. You think people don't know what Hitler is? She's calling him a fascist. Go out on the street, ask 20 people what okay, that means, Johnny Jessica. Johnny on the Hitler patrol. I will. Jesse Waters, who works for a company that had to pay nearly a billion dollars for intentionally misleading its audience under the assumption that its audience was too stupid to know that it was being lied to, thinks that Kamala Harris supporters are too stupid to know what the word fascism means, which is hilarious, primarily because this is a thing that has been said about the right time and time and time again. Again. So here he is just playing a reverse Uno. I'm rubber, your glue. People on the right love to use words that they don't know the meaning of. They love to discuss complicated ideologies that they haven't read about or studied themselves. How many people who regularly call Kamala Harris a commie have actually read the Communist Manifesto? How many people who are anti-anti-fascism know where the word fascism even came from? And they love to just parrot talking points from podcasters because it makes them feel informed and edgy and ahead of the collective stupid curve. And there are countless man on the street type interviews or rally interviews that prove that so many of Trump supporters do not understand why they believe the things they believe. And I know these interviews are cut and spliced and cherry picked so that they can be shared on social media, either to spread awareness of who is actually deciding the future of this country or to drive engagement for the people who posted the video. Maybe both, but regardless, a common theme that you find with the people who can't simply answer questions about the candidate they're rallying to support or the issues they're rallying to promote is that they're scared of some nebulous cloud of irrelevancy that they can't really identify or define. And they're generally ill-informed about the world. Arguably, being well-informed about the world is also scary, but it's a different kind of scary. And of course, no one wants to believe that they are not the brightest in the bunch. Most people don't even want to explore the idea that they might be a little less erudite than their neighbors or strangers on the internet. In our hyper-polarized and politicized society, there is no room for education or insight, let alone compassion. There are only pointless online debates that are meant to be won or lost. Of course, winning and losing is relative in these types of informal forums, so we're all just wasting our time trying to talk to one another as our nation becomes further and further divided. Aren't we tired yet? I do this for a living and I am tired because there is no convincing people of anything at this point. It's not even about convincing. It's difficult to just get people to listen to your perspective at this point. You have one candidate saying actually fascist things in public forums, and when news outlets say this is literally what he said, here is the quote, his supporters all say the exact same thing. They say it was a joke. The woke left can't take a joke. This was taken out of context every time, not an original thought in sight. But speaking of original thoughts and intellectual capacities and just the ability to read and comprehend and analyze information, we are not in a good place in this country. In Ivy League universities, professors are complaining that their students are unable to read difficult or even lengthy texts. Some report that their students had never been made to read an entire book while in high school. They can't keep up with the reading load that had been standard for previous generations, so professors now have to dumb down their university-level curriculums to account for the fact that their students were poorly prepared for life outside of the public school system. And you can blame that on social media and cell phones in classrooms. You can blame it on brain rot from constantly consuming mostly pointless snippets of content for hours a day. Maybe AI is a contributing factor to kids not really doing their homework. Standardized testing has been shown to be problematic as far as actually educating students. You can maybe blame it on the high reported levels of anxiety amongst Gen Z and the youth, which in itself could arguably be blamed at least in part on them growing up in today's political doomsday climate where they have to worry about the planet overheating and or getting shot at while they're trying to learn. I would imagine that's very distracting. But whatever the reason, the end result is the same. We're raising a generation of Americans who lack critical thinking capabilities and we're creating an American society that cannot deal with itself. And sure, there are plenty of possible solutions 
solutions to the hole that we have dug ourselves in however we got here. But there will always be opposition to those possible solutions. And the opposition, again, is unoriginal. Who's going to pay for it? Where is the money going to come from? Trump had no problem inflating our national debt while he was in office. Our Congress has no problem sending billions of dollars to Israel. The government overall has no problem spending money on the dumbest things while taking money out of the public school system. Then they act surprised when the public school system is struggling and they declare it to be a lost cause. They say, you know what? Let's just give up on it. It's unfixable. Let's just shut down the entire Department of Education. It's clearly defunct. Anything to do with school choice, also. Okay. but also separate from school choice, we're going to take the Department of Education, close it. I'm going to close it. We'll have one person, could be you, if you decide to retire. You'd okay, be, Mr. No, Mr. President, here's what, bothers, central me. Here's, what, here's what bothers me about that. So let's say you have a liberal city, let's let's Los Angeles, San Diego, and they just decide, they, oh, we're going to get rid of that history. We got new history. This is America built off the backs of slaves on stolen land. Then and that curriculum comes in. Then we don't send them money. Our right-wing politicians say these things while promoting school choice because school choice directly lines their own pockets. But we know that our politicians are trash. The people who support them, though, I'll never understand why something like eradicating the Department of Education is a celebrated path forward. Ignorance is bliss, I guess, but I really don't want to live in a willfully ignorant society. Do you? Tonight, in a first-of-its-kind decision, the Texas Board of Education approving a controversial new curriculum that allows Bible teachings in public elementary schools. Eight yes, seven no. Eight seven, the motion passes. Well, lessons from the good book could be among the lessons millions of kids in Texas learn next school year. Today, the state school board voting to green light what they call blue bonnet learning curriculum. It infuses the Bible into classes for kids in kindergarten through the fifth grade. This program has been months in the making. It, it's optional. Supporters say that it will help teach subjects like reading and language arts while introducing kids to religious history. Before I was a legislator, I was a Texas public school teacher. And as you mentioned, I'm a current seminary student studying to become a Presbyterian minister. And so I know personally that there is a difference between preaching and teaching. Mm -hmm. Under federal law, schools can teach the Bible as an academic text but not in a devotional way. Uh, in other words, public schools are not Sunday schools. Or as Greg Abbott is fond of saying, schools are for education, not indoctrination. And you know, Laura, I'm not the only one who thinks that this curriculum is unconstitutional. The Texas Republicans who crafted this curriculum also think it's unconstitutional. That was James Tallarico. He is a Texas state representative. He was once a middle school teacher. He's a Democrat and he's a Christian who does not believe in Christian nationalism. He's very much an advocate for the separation of church and state, unlike his fellow Christians across the political aisle. And he believes in public government funded spheres that should be kept free from religion. What a concept. As you can imagine, Texas Republicans have been keeping him quite busy as they continually advocate for more religion in public spaces, including elementary schools. Tallarico has to keep speaking out against them. In the latest stunt from Texas Republicans, the Texas Board of Education recently approved a grade school curriculum that teaches the Bible. The curriculum is optional, but public schools are being incentivized to teach it. These already underfunded public schools can get an infusion of cash if they choose to adopt the Bible-based curriculum. Let's talk about the criticism that's been leveled against this. Rather than apologize for the fact that only one in five uh, students are getting reading level uh, uh, instruction. Instead, the charge has been that this curriculum proselytizes because of its use of biblical references. How would you respond to that? Yeah, my first reaction is that this, the biblical references that are in the materials are historical and cultural literacy. They're not religious instruction. And I remember when I heard that criticism that this is proselytizing. I work at a Bible college, uh, been there for about 20 years now, and trust me, we know what proselytizing looks like. <laughs> Generally, it involves three things. It's knowing who God is, uh, knowing what he wants from us, and then encouraging and administering our coming to God. There's none of that in this curriculum. These biblical references are talking of the ideas that 
well, motivated the actions of many of our uh, key leaders at key times. Uh, and this is not just at the time of the founding. I love how we include and explain in the material many of the biblical references behind Dr. Martin Luther King's uh, movements and actions, right? So this is relevant you know, to the urban kid, to the rural kid, to Texas kids, uh, because it speaks to the, the, the culture and the history uh, of our state and of our nation. The fact of the matter, something that Republicans deny these days, is that we practice freedom of religion here in the United States, and that includes the freedom not to practice any religion. As more and more people are turning away from major organized religions, including Christianity, Republicans find this to be very worrying as a trend. They believe that the United States is a Christian nation and it should remain a Christian nation. You can certainly argue to an extent that this country was founded on Christian ideals and values, primarily for the simple fact that the Founding Fathers were white male Christians. But even back then, they were just practicing a version of those Christian values and ideals, a version that suited their own needs. Tallarico is a great example of someone who reads the Bible in a way that is more egalitarian and more just and more tolerant. It's also a less naive reading of the Bible because it does not assume that everyone in the entire world either is or should be or wants to be a Christian. That Republican Christian standard is kind of ridiculous. It's short-sighted, it's illogical, and it's not going to happen. Even if they mandated Christianity across the nation, it doesn't mean that people are going to suddenly buy into all of it. Of course, to a certain extent, they know that, which is why they're currently targeting impressionable young minds while they're still in school. Nowadays, unless a kid is put by their parents into some kind of church-run Sunday school or if they attend a private religious school, they're not getting much exposure to religion. It was a parent's prerogative as far as what kind of religious exposure their kids would get, and these Republican parents really love the idea of choice but only for themselves, certainly not for anyone who thinks or lives differently than they do. We all know the MO by now. If you can't convince people to join your side freely, just force it upon them. With the rise in apostasy across the US and Europe, the religious right is panicking. Pew Research data from 2022 says that since the 1990s, an increasing number of Americans are leaving Christianity specifically and identifying as atheist, agnostic, or nothing in particular. The data suggests that at this rate, along with certain societal and political factors, Christianity is on track to continue its downward trend over the next several decades in all of four different hypothetical scenarios. Similarly, the number of those religious nuns, or people who are not affiliated with any religion, is expected to continue to rise, with the most aggressive projection estimating that religious nuns could make up over 50% of Americans by the year 2070. Across the pond in England and Wales, a similar trend is taking place. According to reporting from The Guardian, the 2021 census found that the cities of Leicester and Birmingham have become the first UK cities to have minority majorities, and that for the first time, England and Wales have less than half of citizens identifying as Christians. Over the past 20 years, the number of people reporting no religious affiliation has increased by 22 percentage points from 14.8% to 37.2%. Included in the reasons for leaving Christianity, as cited by people living in both the UK and the US, our LGBTQ intolerance within the church, the behavior of other self-identifying and practicing Christians, politics, specifically issues pertaining to women's rights, and the Christian affiliation with Donald Trump, and intellectual integrity referring to the contradictions between the religious world and the secular and scientific worlds. And as Republicans target younger and younger Americans, the youngest generation that's currently able to vote is also reportedly leaving religion behind, with many of them citing LGBTQ intolerance as a primary reason. So I don't have children, and it's not likely that I will have children as long as I'm still living in Texas for a few reasons, but I'm not jealous of parents around here who now have the added stress of having to find a school for their kids that is in a good school district and in a good neighborhood that has also chosen not to accept the state's $60 per student to teach a Bible-based curriculum, as if being a parent in this country is not already difficult enough as it is. To me, religion and religious mandates in public spaces especially are a sign of societal regression and regressive thinking. They call it being conservative, but let's be real, these Republicans are trying to bring back laws from literal centuries ago. 
and the amount of time and money they spend on forcing something on the public that has a documented history of declining affiliation is embarrassing, not just for them, but for our entire system of government. How these religious zealots keep getting elected says quite a bit about how representative our representative democracy truly is, but that is another story for another day.